Since 1995, over 26,000 international students from all walks of life join the British investigators' training courses in anomalous phenomena within ufology, paranormal and supernatural, parapsychological study, anomalous phenomena, science, hypnotherapy, spiritualism, astrology, astronomy, cryptozoology and many other areas. Our certified self-study courses will teach you how to assess, analyze, engage, formulate, document and be cognizant of all types of phenomena. Suitable for light workers and star seeds, curious personalities and inquisitive minds, skeptics alike and truth seekers. Stories of a mysterious animal slaughtering lambs on the moor became national news in the early 1980s. Reports of strangely mutilated animals and blood-curdling screams heard echoing across the moor filled the papers. But tales of peculiar goings-on are nothing new on Exmoor. Exmoor has a sort of air of mystery. Whether you've lived here all your life or whether you're new to the area, it has a sort of magic about it. Um, there's so many uh, places like this, like the Valley of the Rocks, the Devil's Cheese Ring, um, the Longstone Men here's on the moors, the Bronze Age barrows and uh, hut circles and things, and it all uh, sort of comes together to make Exmoor rather special. And, um, you know, there is a definite enchantment about the moor anyway. There's the um, ongoing stories of the Black Hound sightings on Exmoor and Dartmoor and right across North Devon, um, sightings right through to Barnstaple and Linton here of huge hounds with glaring eyes and uh, all that sort of stuff. So I think uh, that's bound to capture the imagination and uh, the whole aspect of it uh, lends itself to the Beast of Exmoor story, really. Exmoor is the setting for regular ritual duels between man and beast. When the slaughter of lambs started to threaten the livelihood of already hard-hit Exmoor farmers, the Dulverton and West Foxhounds were called in to see if they could track down the beast. The hounds, bred to pursue foxes, failed to pick up any scent of it. Many farmers who believed the attacks were simply the work of a large wild dog began to think again. The first major losses had occurred at Drewston Farm near South Milton. Farmer Eric Lay had lost more than 30 sheep, almost one a night for a month. But heavily armed Royal Marines, bounty hunters, trackers and farmers failed to track it down. It was impossible not to be interested. I mean, we lived in the middle of the area where all these killings were taking place. I mean, it, it was amazing. It just, you know, it sort of hit everybody. Everybody was talking about it in the whole district certainly wasn't a sort of uh, peaceful sort of countryside atmosphere, you know. It, it, it was quite charged. I mean, we had some real characters. I mean, there was a bloke that came yeah. to Marlin once who reckoned that he had two dogs that would track anything. And one of them turned out to be a poodle. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, we put them in the field and they spent five minutes cocking their legs and didn't take on to anything, did they? Yes, I think his wife actually was backing him up in there and she said, my husband. All you need is love. Everybody said that. And we had that McGee chap, that. I mean, <laughs> McGee, the then, court, what, the what bloke that bloke killed a policeman in Yorkshire. Oh, that's right. Yes. I mean, he was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But he, like the rest of them, he ran over his tail between his legs. So. Uh, you said we had all sorts of characters. There was the gypsy fellow that did the rain dance with the Tom Rowe. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and we had a medium with a watch that was just going to mm. dictate where she was going to kill it on the map. You know, where right. thing was going to kill it. Was a, a red Indian with a helicopter or something around? That's oh. right, yeah. But you met me at Drewston. Yeah. When we when uh, when you were in the Marines. That's right. Yeah. That's the first time actually I met. Yeah, that's right. We yeah. came up. As I said before, on a recce, you know. Yeah, that's right. And then we stayed for a week, and then we got pulled out, and then we stayed yeah. for another well, 78 days in total, anyway. Yeah. And we moved around from Drewstone, and then up onto Exmoor, yeah. up yeah. North Molton, we went everywhere. But I was out in a chicken house with an old chap, do you remember, on the railway line? Mm -hmm. 
and this thing screamed three times, and it always seemed, I heard it two or three times. Three times, yeah. Three this times, exactly three my times. My wife used to hear, yeah. you know, when we were... Now, and that scream, mm. it wasn't a dog, and it wasn't a screech owl, and it wasn't a no. fox, it wasn't a vixen. No. Uh, it was definitely, and it literally made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. We heard it, our next door neighbor heard it, and the neighbor beyond, and one about a mile away heard it for three consecutive nights screaming mm. and what you said about hairs on the back of your neck come up yeah it did because it's, it's such an unnatural right. sound to us that you do wonder what the hell it is one stage mystery animals in britain everyone thought of a lot of monsters but nowadays the exmoor beast is very famous, certainly and abroad as well. But the Exmoor beast has been in the news almost constantly since 1983, and each year there seem to be new developments, new discoveries concerning it. It's it, it, quite obvious it's more than just a mystery, there is something definitely there. The most popular current theory is that the beast is a cat like animal. And quite a variety of cats once in Britain, but no longer today. Um, the cave lion, the leopard, um, the European jaguar, which is different to the South American one, um, Martelli's wild cat, which is now extinct, Owen's panther, related to the modern-day leopard, even a saber-toothed scimitar cat, and, of course, the lynx and the modern-day uh, common wild cat. In 1983, a farmer confirmed that it might be a big cat when he did something while walking in his woods. And as I walked forward, I saw about 50 paces ahead of me a large black animal that I, well, I can describe it only as a cat-like animal, squatting on the middle of the path, sitting rather like a cat does in front of a fire on its haunches. And I realized at once that I was seeing something that I'd probably never seen before. We stared at each other literally for about four seconds, and then I ducked down and went back to the kitchen to get my binoculars that I keep there. And of course, when I came back, the thing had gone. My immediate reaction was, I've seen the beast. <laughs> I went in and called my wife and said, I think I've seen the beast of Exmoor, or whatever it is. And I described what I'd seen to her. And um, we rec I reckon it was. Whatever it was, I don't know. It was definitely a big, black, jet black, cat-like animal that could have been a puma or a panther, something of that description. <laughs> I can state with absolute certainty that we have got a big cat situation in North Devon, on Exmoor, and in fact in the whole of the West Country. I've been to within uh, 30 paces of one of the black cats and also uh, photographed it, albeit rather badly, at about 100 metres distance. It's an animal of something like four and a half feet long, with a very long uh, upcurved tail and uh, it stands about two foot high at the shoulders with a definite uh, cat's head, uh, yellow green eyes. You know, what we have is a big cat without any question at all. And I looked back to see if there weren't any sheep in the bog and I saw two ears sticking out something in the structure. And uh, I turned the horse's head towards that way and I was sort of looking down on it and then it jumped up. And, I mean, I was sort of dreaming, I wasn't thinking of what I was seeing, and I suddenly thought, what earth is that? It wasn't a dog, you know, nothing else. Well, I suddenly realised it was an animal. I mean, it was sort of a cat animal. Mm. It had the most beautiful um, fur. Mm. It was absolutely lovely, black, Everybody's, shiny. Yeah. <laughs> it was no more than 15 yards away from me. I, cr I was in second gear, I cruised to a stop, because I was fascinated by this thing. Mm. It came out jumped into the road, one bang, up onto the bank. If you had to give it a colour, if it was horse, you'd say it was done. My, my first thought was it was a little lioness, but then, you know, you, you, you sort of... Mm, colour's wrong. Yeah, you sort of see what it is then, and there it was, to me it was a mountain lion. But after I'd seen that, I knew what I'd seen. You know, I've been in the country all my life, and I, I knew it was not anything that yeah. you know you was you British naturalists like Trevor Beer are convinced that there are big cats roaming the hills but he doesn't agree that they're responsible for all the killings I'm still convinced that the situation was caused mainly by dogs 
and uh, I still say that's the cause of most of the sheep kills on Exmoor anyway. Um, but of course, the big cats were have also observed in that area and elsewhere on the moors, and uh, they may well kill the occasional sheep when times are very hot. I don't think anyone's actually seen a big cat kill a sheep or even eating from a carcass as yet. But many dogs have been seen doing that, of course. Certain kills are certainly very dog-like, no doubt about it, but other, others may be more feline because, of course, there are slight differences in, in the nature of the kill. Dog kills, to me, are far messier. There isn't, cat kills are notoriously clean. They do certain things. They go for... Um, but normally, a large cat, a puma or a panther, if it um, attacks a deer or so forth, would um, bite the neck or strangle by um, a bite of the throat. And it would then... Um, eviscerate the animal, it would take out the, literally take out the, the internal organs. Interestingly, it would bury the entrails, the stomach and the gut, it, it has no interest in that at all, it, it eats the heart, and the liver particularly, because cats can't um, synthesize vitamin A, so they get the vitamin A from the liver, so that's one of the prime organs that he goes for. Um, the kidneys, the lungs, that type of thing. Then it'll start to eat the meat itself around the rib cage, often the, the muscles of the limbs of, of, of the animal. And it'll basically carry on eating until, until it, it, it's fully fed. Whether dogs or large cats are responsible, the killings continue. At Ovis Farm near Brayford, the beast has become a very real threat to their livelihood, and some even suggest their safety. Let's start serving vegetables. Oh, yeah. Has anyone seen the beast recently, or has there been any signs of it around here? Well, it last killed on about the 17th of December. It was due to come again a week later, as it normally does, but the, hound, the hunt came round, and I haven't seen it since then. What signs does it leave that you know that it's, it's been oh, around? The, the way it actually kills and eats the sheep. Well, this animal, whatever it is, it rips, definitely rips the throat out and drinks the blood. There's never any blood around. Then it will peel back the wool and the skin as if it's a, a person taking the skin off. And then it take, carefully takes out the stomach contents. Sorry to be rude in the table. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it's it, it very cleverly eats the meat as if it's carving the meat off the bone. The ribs on it as well look just like... Yes, yes, that was what, beginning of December. There was one about 50 yards from the cottage, obviously struck in the middle of the night at some point, and just left a horribly mutilated shape afterwards, and a couple of footprints, and that was all there was. Imagining it walk past the cottage mm -hmm. while we were just yeah, sitting in there. Probably did walk very close to the cottage at some point. So it makes you think of it when you go out for a walk at night time, you never know what's lurking in the shadows. Yeah, when you go out, to put the chicken down. <laughs> yes, who's going to feed the chickens tonight? Oh, there's still going to be chickens left. When we were first moved here about six years ago, I heard rumours of the beast of Exmoor, and I just thought they were sort of funny Exmoor rumours, you know, because it, it's got a yeah, strange no, Exmoor's got a mystical side to it, and there's supposed to be hobgoblins and witches in the woods and spirits, um, and I thought it was a rumour of that ilk. A lot of people believe it doesn't exist and think it's a think they think it's a supernatural. Uh, animal al along with all the other legends of the piskies and the ghosts and uh, witches as well, isn't there? It's a very yes. witchy area, this. Yes, and that, that's why it can travel so far and kill sheep in one district and then come and then kill them in another miles and miles away. And they see, I don't know if it's supposed to be bad luck or good luck to see it, but uh, most people just think it's is supernatural or doesn't exist. The night that we took that um, carcass to the vet, oh, yes. that mm. was really terrible, that was the most clever. And then the, the eyes that we saw as we came yeah, down, down the lane. Strange. When we drove back down the lane, we saw a set of eyes about the size of our black dog. It was totally we, dark uh, as we well. We had the carcass just in the back of the van. Just caught the light and uh, they seemed like high off the ground. And uh, looked taller much, than a dog. Yeah, yeah, much taller than a dog or... Um, cat or fox or anything. Really dark as well. And it was like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> we were checking the foot. So, so we rode up and we drove, we drove down, down, like looking into, because you know how narrow the hedge is, mm. looking in the hedge, couldn't see anything, stopped, and got out and walked back with the torch and going along, <laughs> you know, just, just waiting for something. And with the collars up there. I didn't think if it did go for your throat. <laughs> whatever. Making a lot of noise, just in case. <laughs> yes, the trap. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like, Amanda? What's lovely? Lovely, lovely. I can see why the beast eats. The beast would have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> the beast hasn't got mint sauce. It's missing out. We should leave some out there.
Nigel Brierley, retired horticulturalist and writer, has spent the past eight years scientifically looking for clues to the identity of the beast. He has laid strong cat essence in a number of woods. He hopes the scent will attract the creatures, which will then leave identifying pad marks in soft sand as they sniff the irresistible oil. He believes he already has strong evidence for big cats. First of all, uh, when the beast arrived, um, I thought it was merely an escaped uh, big cat which has escaped. And I think most people had different ideas at the time, but this was the idea at first. And then, uh, from that, I suddenly realized that we were looking at uh, big cats that had been around for from the 60s onwards by asking various farmers and hearing what they'd seen. So it got more and more interesting. Uh, another interesting part was that uh, the big cats that were being seen were all supposed to be black, but I found that they weren't all black. There were brown ones as well. The beast of Exmoor implies a single animal, the very most a single species. But the eyewitness reports, there are so many of them, when you gather them together, you find that the descriptions of the animals fall into certain categories time and time again, the same few categories. These categories come up again and again. Some people reporting a lynx-like creature, you know, greyish, yellowish fur with short tail and very tufted ears. Others, a larger, longer creature, tawny brown, black-tipped tail. Um, which is more puma-like, and then, of course, of the famous, what most people think of when they think of a beast of Exmoor, the panther-like creature, absolutely jet black, seven, eight foot long in some cases, which certainly corresponds very closely with the, the abnormally coloured leopard, which we call the black panther, the all-black version of the leopard. The variety of sightings suggest that there is more than one beast, and raises the possibility that they could be breeding, and their numbers increasing. If there are enough of them, they would certainly breed. I mean, they would know of each other's existence, territorial marking, um, calls and so forth. If there were pumas in the area, the pumas would soon know of each other's existence there. And they would certainly breed, given the, given the opportunity. I mean, in any case, Exmoor and Dartmoor, there are very similar habitats to that in their native, in the pumas' case, North America, in the lynxes' case, Northern Europe, again, North America. So the habitat isn't that different. So as long as there are a few specimens there of the same age and so forth, and opposite sex and whatever, yes, it, it, could, it could happen. But what we have got here um, are a number of pumas uh, on the loose, but there must be um, something like seven or more pumas, at least. And there has to be more than two of the black leopard type cat as well. So where do they come from? In the 60s and 70s, numerous people kept wild and dangerous animals in private collections or as pets in their homes. Cases of animals escaping and becoming a danger to the public led to the passing of the Zoo Licensing Act in 1981. The act dramatically restricted the keeping such animals by private individuals. Many were destroyed, but some were simply released into the wild. What I think these reports are, are escapees or deliberate releases from captivity. And I think there have been quite a number over the years, and perhaps more as the years have progressed, particularly with new laws, new legislation, that have tightened up the keeping of animals, particularly by private individuals. And an easy way to get around those laws is simply to release the animal. An animal that's kept reared under normal conditions in a zoo or a park or a private collection, if they were released into a wild area, I think they would manage perfectly well. They're very fast. My pumas in their enclosure catch pigeon and rabbit or anything that enters the enclosure. They have no trouble whatever of catching wild uh, creatures. So I think uh, survival would be easy for them here in the southwest of England, definitely. Nigel Brierley believes that the beast will always outwit its hunters with its superior senses of smell and sight. He has thus designed a trap, which he intends to monitor over a period of months, even years, hoping that the beast will become accustomed to it and one day lure it inside. Well, the trap is very, very simple. Um, the, it's got to be um, the right size. In fact, it's got to be long enough because these animals are pretty long compared to, say, an ordinary dog. I mean, they're longer than that. 
and it's got to be as simple as possible and effective. If one's caught, I hope that that will lead us to others. I think it's important to catch one, and I think it's important to uh, attach a radio collar and try and find out how far they're, how far they're moving. The chance of it actually being captured are quite remote, frankly, unless a, a really concerted effort is made, because the, the, the cat has all the advantages, and it, it has the, the, the knowledge of the region, it has its inherent ability to conceal itself. The cats are certainly probably the most elusive creatures on Earth. I think there's nothing more able to conceal itself better than a cat, if, if, if it so wishes. Um, also, their inherent shyness. Pumas have a notorious reputation, yet it's completely undeserved. In, in the whole of documented history, there have only been a handful of reports, confirmed reports of pumas attacking um, humans. It's quite the opposite. Pumas will absolutely go out of their way to keep away from, from humans. I've got a grudge in respect for it to a certain extent. He's beaten everybody, hasn't he? He has yeah. beaten everybody, and I mean, the, I, the I chances are you'll move on now and I beat somebody else. I think a time or two, Lady Luck has been on his side. Yeah. yeah. Having said that, I take me out of to this cunningness, cunning ability of it. But mm. there's two or three instances that I can think of where Lady Luck is definitely favoured. When Andy was up there, he only had a matter of a few weeks left to go in the Marines, and he was hoping to catch it before he retired. I mean, it was seven, what, six years ago, seven years ago I, now, I, when, I, when I, we, we I, were chasing I, it. I've got about two years to go in the police force. I'd like to know before I retire from the police force what it is. Well, I certainly like to know before I, you know, go to higher places. I'd rather, I'd rather... Well, we're trying to get that. <laughs> I think the whole subject should be taken a lot more seriously. At the moment, it's still the type of silly season as far as um, subject for the newspapers when they haven't got much story. They put a story of the Exmoor Beast in. And I think that attitude is completely outdated. And I've saw in recent years, admittedly not in Britain, but elsewhere in the world, the uh, new species being discovered all the while. And new types of animals, in the sense animals that are not expected to be there, have been discovered in all sorts of regions. To me, it's the most powerful predator we've got. In, in the country, which is running around. I think people have got to realise that it is there. I think um, as the longer you delve into the mystery of it and try to um, pin them down, the more you see them in the wild, um, you have a sort of affinity with them and, and very much want them to uh, stay part of the moor, just as the red deer and the buzzards and everything else. Um, they're now part of the whole wild scene as it were and ought to be left alone and take only pictures leave only footprints and kill only time and that's the best way to look at it i think if the beast is trapped it will be the end of one of the most mystifying sagas of modern times but there are still those who believe it can never be caught that having evaded every attempt to capture it the beast is more than just flesh and blood.